Hi there. I am so happy you chose to worship God with us here at the Cloverdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. I invite you to allow the presence of God to fill you up. Also, if you are desiring to support the cause of Christ uh, through your kind generosity, or maybe you have some questions, please feel free to visit our website at uh, cloverdale.org. <laughs> um, I want to summarize. So th to last two weeks ago, I had preached on the investigative judgment part one. And I took some time to share this message through the story of Caleb, I keep saying that, Cain and Abel. <laughs> Cain and Abel. And we see where Cain disobeyed God's command. Then he murdered his brother. And God comes down to investigate. And we see that the, investigate, the investigation that God was doing had another component to it. Meaning, God asks Cain, where is your brother Abel and what have you done? And the reason God is doing this, he's, ask, he's giving Cain a chance to confess and repent. The truth of the matter is you and I know that, that Cain already knew, or rather God already knew where Abel was. But he was giving Cain a chance to confess and repent, which instead he digged in his heel and add another sin to his list of sins. He added indifference to his sin. And so God had no choice but to banish Cain. And in the process of doing so, Cain cries out to God and says, God, people who see me, they will kill me. And God, in his compassion, had mercy on him and placed a temporary mark of protection upon him before sending him out. But still, the request that Cain made gives us an idea that Cain was just concerned about himself more than anyone else. Still, God placed a temporary mark of protection upon him. So that was a summary of part one of the investigative judgment. Today, we're going to be looking at part two. And I want to first thank my professor, um, Dr. Richard Davidson, who has made this um, information available so that I can share it with you, just to talk about the beauty of the investigative judgment. And so the scripture reading has already been done so well, so I won't even read it again, but I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, it is your time. Won't you speak to all of us today, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. There is, <clears throat> oh, before I get there, a, a Scottish lawyer who was a wicked man hired a horse, either through accident or ill usage, he ended up killing the horse. The owner insisted that the lawyer pay the full value for the loss of the horse. The lawyer agreed but said he did not have enough cash at the time to cover for the cost of the horse. Would the owner of the horse accept an IOU? He said. The wicked lawyer then asks that the owner of the horse if he could allow him some time to, to pay for the horse. Then the trusting owner of the horse said, you can set the date as to when you will be able to pay for the horse. Whatever 
time you think is reasonable. He said this to the wicked lawyer. Whatever, whenever you think you can pay for the horse, write that on the IOU. And so the wicked lawyer wrote a note payable to the day of judgment. Eventually the owner of the horse got tired of waiting for the day of judgment to come. It just never came. And so he took the matter to court. The wicked lawyer spoke up and said, Judge, look at the date that is on the IOU, the promissory note. And so the judge looked at the paper, he picked it up, he looked at it, and he said, sure enough, this note is good. Then he looked over to the wicked lawyer and said, Sir, today is the day of judgment. You better pay up. You know, there's much we can learn about the judgment from the book of Ezekiel. And God gave the responsibility to preach God's last warning message. He gave this responsibility to Ezekiel to preach God's last warning message to the professed people of God before the close of probation. The book of Revelation also follows the basic structure of Ezekiel. And what we see here is that the seal of God and the close of probation in Revelation 14 and 15 is built on the picture of Ezekiel with a mark on the foreheads of those sighing and crying for the abominations in Jerusalem. And both Ezekiel and Revelation gives us an idea of how much God will deal with his people before the close of probation. And so today, today, we're going to be traveling through the book of Ezekiel at light speed. Uh, the, the idea here is that I could have turned this part of the message into two messages. So we could have a part three. But something would be lost. And so I didn't want to stretch it out. So we're going to be traveling through Ezekiel very fast. I'll give the scripture references, so for those of you who want to write it down and go home and kind of do some more research on what I'm sharing, that's fine. But, um, but we're going to go through this real quickly. Are you ready? If you're ready, say amen. 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 All right. Here we go. So, in the last years of Judah, we see God conducting an investigation. In Ezekiel chapter 1 to chapter 2, we see God sitting on a movable throne. In Ezekiel chapter 1 to chapter 2, we see God sitting on a movable throne. It seems as though he is heading somewhere. And you might be familiar with the, 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 the scripture passage which says, talks about a wheel in a wheel or a fiery chariot. There's a glaze over your eyes, so let me come a little closer. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air. You heard that song before? That is what I'm talking about. Whew. That is what I'm talking about. So God is on this movable uh, chariot, and I would like to call it his divine mobile. He's, he's on his divine mobile, and he's heading somewhere. So that's Ezekiel chapter 1 to chapter 2. Now we're going, we're jumping now to Ezekiel chapter 3 to chapter 8. And here we go. Chapter 3 to chapter 8 tells us where God is heading. God enters the temple, which was built by the children of Israel. And the reason he enters the temple, the reason he's there is because his, 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 his children are very naughty. They have been very, they've been doing some things that they aren't, they weren't supposed to be doing. And so God comes down to investigate. Because his people had violated his 
covenant, and God now has a lawsuit against them. Now, some of the things that they did that they weren't supposed to be doing were they had erected an image of jealousy. When we read the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, God says, I am a jealous God. And so this was now a slap in God's face. They erected an image of jealousy. The other uh, charge that God had against them or the other thing that they did that they weren't supposed to do was they were involved in Egyptian spiritualistic worship. Again, as we read the Ten Commandments, one of the things we know about God is that God says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Again, they, this was a slap in God's face. But these children of his did not stop there. They had another one. They did another one. That was they were preaching false gospel about the dead. The Bible says the dead knows nothing, right? Yet still they were preaching a false doctrine about the dead. But there was one charge against Israel which caused God to bring down the hammer on Israel. A charge that brought about the close of probation. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 16 tells us, So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door and the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their back toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the they were worshiping the sun. Does that ring a bell? Absolutely. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17 also talk about a false day of worship. And as a result of these lawsuit and them breaking the covenant, God now investigate into what was taking place. And he ends up with two groups of people. But before we get to that, those talk about those two groups of people. I want to just uh, bring you to where, I, where we are right now. We have traveled from Ezekiel chapter 1 to chapter 8. And now we are jumping over to chapter 9. And here we see God completing his investigation. He ends up with two groups of people. The first group has chosen to serve God no matter what. On the persecution, they're going to serve God. No matter what. These are the ones that were sighing and crying because of the intensity of the sin problem. And so God places a mark on their foreheads or he placed a mark of the tav. The T-A-V. This word is the is the, is the, is the, what do you call it now? The, is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And check this out. It is in the shape of a cross. So God places a tav on the foreheads of his people, and that tav, the Hebrew word, is in the shape of a cross. Just an interesting point right there. Now the second group who broke God's covenant, who worshiped the Son, who preached false doctrine, they were sentenced to death. They were sentenced to death. Now we are moving from the investigative judgment to the execution judgment. But I don't want you to miss this. Before the, just before the execution judgment begins, God does one last investigative judgment. He does one last one. And and, and, and we get an idea, what we see here is the attitude of God is a little bit different. Ezekiel chapter 18 says, God, we see God speaking. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Turn from your evil ways and live. Now, I'm going to summarize this real quickly. What we see so far is 
God conducting an investigative judgment. First, we saw him on his fiery chariot, his divine mobile, and he enters the temple. He conducts a investigation. He finds two groups of people. Uh, he finds one guilty. He finds the other innocent. And now he's about to uh, execute judgment. But, but, but something is different about his attitude after he is finished. And we're going to talk a little bit about that right now. So now we're going to jump to Ezekiel chapter 10 to chapter 11. We're going to summarize that. God, again, God is finished conducting his investigation. He's about to leave the temple. But he's reluctant to leave. He's about to leave the temple, but he's reluctant to leave. And so look at the movement of God as, as, as he is moving. He, he's finished and he's, he's leaving, but, but he's reluctant to leave. So watch what happens. The movable throne is waiting empty at the south side of the temple. Then the glory of God moves slowly to the ark in the most holy place. He then moves to the threshold and pause. He then moves to the east gate and pause. Do you see what's happening? It seems as though God is reluctant to leave. He seems to be waiting for just one more person to change their mind. And then he moves across the Kidron Valley and stops. And then the scene ends right there. Some scholars, upon witnessing the reluctance of God in Ezekiel chapter 9, in, in the book of Ezekiel in general, uh, raise the question could this be why God has not yet returned? Is he waiting for just one more person to accept him? Just one more. Standing before God are a group of guilty people, and God is reluctant to leave. He does not want anyone to perish. And so we're going to look real quickly at Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And what we see in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 is someone, someone else enters the scene. And this someone that has entered the scene is the devil. And what it does, it describes clearly him accusing the brethren. How often? Day and night. We see Satan pointing out the sins of God's people. You see, God's people are clothed in filthy garments. They were clothed in dung. Not even a jackhammer could clean up their, the, the mess that was caked upon their bodies. And the devil is loving it. He is having a wonderful time as he's there pointing out their sins. Can you see him doing some back, back flips and some heel kicks? He is laughing. He is ecstatic because he knows that God cannot or he thinks that God cannot do anything to save these guys. Some of the things that he was doing, he was pointing out their filthy garments, their defective characters. He was pointing out or he presented their weaknesses, the unlawful likeness of their character to Christ. Uh, he was pointing out how they dishonored their Savior. The devil is saying there is no way, no way you can save these wretched people. The people of God, they are aware of their sinful state. And as a result, they're feeling hopeless and helpless. Now, now comes the amazing part of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 23. God says, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name 
then at the end of that verse, he says, I'm going to vindicate the holiness of my great name, great name through you. Now, you just missed your shout right there. You just missed your amen right there. So I'm going to give you another chance a little later on. And if you catch it well, if you don't well, I'm going to be praying for you. <laughs> but here is it. Don't, don't miss this. Um, the devil thinks that God is not able to make a way of escape for his erring children. And it is at this time that someone else, someone else enters the scene. And all eyes turn around wondering, who is this person this person walks through the crowd walks past the filthy uh, dung filled group of people standing before God and he stands he's now facing God and he he looks up at God and says father we did it father we did it father we did it <laughs> Let me put it another way. Uh, I love how Dr. Richard put it. He says, the way in which we are accepted in the judgment is not based upon our performance because even our best efforts is still not good enough. We are accepted in the judgment solely on the basis of the imputed righteousness of Christ. We cannot answer the charges of Satan against us. Christ alone can make an effectual plea in our behalf. He continues, he is able to silence the accuser with arguments founded not upon our merits, but his own. But his own. In the judgment, God's people, the divine advocate, pleads on their behalf. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude, who knows their sin and also their repent repentance, declares, the Lord rebukes you, Satan. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. Listen, he continues, I gave my life for these souls. They are graven upon the palms of my hands. Jesus, our advocate, plea, presents an effectual plea on behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. Here comes the best part. Don't miss your amen. He says, he pleads their cause and vanquishes their accuser by the mighty arguments of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. And that's why, that's the way God made an escape for you and I. Somebody ought to say, thank you, God, for Calvary. Thank you, God, for making a way of escape. And so God is saying, I, I got to clear my name. I got to vindicate my name. But I'm going to do so by saving you, by making a way of escape for you. Of course, he can't force your, our hands. We have to accept that invitation. So just in case you missed it, just because, just because of my ex excitement, I want you to understand, Jesus paid the price for us. He has given you and I a gift, and all we have to do in the courtroom, in his presence, is just accept. In 2006, I left Jamaica to travel to Canada where I worked as a student missionary for several years. And uh, then in 2009, the leadership team thought it would be a good idea to mentor me to become a part of their team. And one of their first moves was to take me to the United States for a leadership program and to mentor me and, and, and allow me to learn uh, what it is, uh, what it would take to become a leader. But unfortunately, their plan backfired because I met a young damsel. <laughs> <laughs> Two years later, we got married. And then in 2015, in 2015, um, I applied for my citizenship to the United States, Amen. to this beautiful country. Amen, thank you. Actually, I just celebrated a few days my fifth year here uh, for citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. 
Praise God. Praise God. You know, one thing that was special about this occasion was while I was in the courtroom, there were many of us there in the courtroom um, as we were getting sworn in. There are some from Afghanistan, some from Iraq, uh, some from Venezuela, some. There were people from all over the world that were there standing before the judge. And there is a little bit of excitement, but some nervousness. We were excited because a few days earlier, we all received a letter in the mail which said, congratulations, come to the, your swearing ceremony so that you can become a full citizen of this country. And so while we were there standing before the judge, we knew that we were actually citizens already. We, we, all we had to do was accept that invitation and make it official. Friends of mine, God is extending an inv another invitation to you and I. He's extending another invitation and all he wants for you to do is just accept it. He has done the heavy lifting already. Won't you accept? Won't you accept? And I want to make a, a special appeal today, not, not to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but if you're in this room and you have not made that leap, that jump, I wanna, I wanna talk to you for a few minutes. I want to talk to you for a few minutes. Right now, God cannot continue to be reluctant for too long. At some point in time, He will need to close the door of probation. But He's keeping it open long enough for just one more. And I'm wondering if that one more is here today. If you are the one who has not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to stand. No, if you've been baptized, if you accepted Jesus Christ, I'm not talking to you. Uh, church, I want you to help me. If you could bow your heads and just pray for that person. Bow your heads. You have heard this message and, and you, your spirit, the Spirit of God is whispering in your ear saying, it is time, son, daughter, it is time. It is time to make that bold step for me. It is time to declare whose side you are on. If this is you, I want to make this opportunity available to you. Won't you stand? For far too long, the devil has been holding you captive. And you want to say, Lord, liberate me. Free me. I want, I want to be on the right side. I want, to be, I, want to, I want to be with you, Jesus. And don't look at the person that is sitting beside you because they are praying for you right now. I invite you to, 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 to stand as we, we I, pr I want to pray for you. The devil might be whispering in your ears, someone like you cannot be saved. There's no way. You know who you are. But Jesus has already, already paid that price for you. He has already made a way of escape for you. He took your place at Calvary. And another thing about the devil, he's a liar. He's a defeated foe, and his doom is sure. And the reason he may be whispering in your ear right now is because he wants you to join him. But if, but if you have not accepted Christ yet. I want to invite you to stand if that's you. And one last thing. God's name and character are the same. When Moses asks God to see him, God says, you can see me and live, Moses, but I allow my character to pass by you. 
I'll allow my character to pass by you. And God's character that, that was passing by Moses was his holiness, his lovingness, his patience, and his long-suffering. And this is the character that is being vindicated through you and for you. But the truth is God cannot be long-suffering for too long. His long-suffering has an expiry date. And so if this is you, won't you stand? At this time, I want to invite the church. Won't you stand with us as I invite also our praise team to come on up as we sing or closing hymn. And even though you might not have stand, I want to still pray for you at the end of our closing hymn. Thank God for technology. Amen. Well, no one here stood. Well, there's someone here who texted me and said, Pastor, I want to talk with you. I want to talk with you. Praise the Lord. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. God... You have spoken today. And <laughs> it's amazing how your spirit works. And it's amazing how you have made technology available so that the gospel will not be confined to a building but can spread all over the world. And I know that your spirit is still speaking today to all of us. And, 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 for us who have already accepted your, you into our hearts, we just want to make a recommitment and say, God, I am yours. Won't you make that seal through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord? Please. Thank you for making that way of escape. And thank you for, for make, giving a chance to that one more person to make it into your kingdom before these doors of probation is closed. In Jesus' name, everybody say, Amen. 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 I hope you are blessed by today's message. If you have any questions or uh, would like someone to pray with you or for you, please feel free to contact us. May God bless you and keep you till we meet again.